You know, God knows the future. God understands the future. Now, we don't. And we really believe that. This is a really good time to pray and ask God to show us how to act and how to respond. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. And the name of this program is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering the Bible. Take your Bible guide out because we're going to study that today as we go through it. And Corey is here with Ryan. Corey? Today I'm going to be taking a look at Ezekiel chapter 6 and incense. Ryan? Well, in the early chapters of Ezekiel, the prophet encounters four living creatures. And my segment today documents how these very real angelic beings could be the inspiration for mythological creatures like the Sphinx and the Griffin. And that's coming up in 20 minutes time. So make sure you're ready for that. 25 minutes, Janice is coming up. Today, light in a dark place. All right, so get your Bible guide out and get your Bible out. The Bible is the most important book of all. Let's listen to what God says to us as we explore. Ezekiel 5, 11 through 17. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will also diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. One third of you shall die of the pestilence, and be consumed with famine in your midst. And one third shall fall by the sword all around you, and I will scatter another third to all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall my anger be spent, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be avenged. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal, when I have spent my fury upon them. Moreover, I will make you a waste and a reproach among the nations that are all around you in the sight of all who pass by. So it shall be a reproach, a taunt, a lesson, and an astonishment to the nations that are all around you when I execute judgments among you in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I send against them the terrible arrows of famine, which shall be for destruction, which I will send to destroy you, I will increase the famine upon you and cut off your supply of bread. So I will send against you famine and wild beasts, and they will bereave you. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Ezekiel chapter 5, verses 11 through 17. Ezekiel chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. That's what we study today. We're going to focus on a couple of things. The years covered in the Old Testament were difficult for God's people. The Lord gave them chance after chance, yet they consistently disobeyed him. Now, Ezekiel 5, 7, and 8 describes what the Lord would do as a result. Quote, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations that are all around you and have not walked in my statutes, nor kept my judgments, nor even done according to the judgments of of the nations that are around you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, indeed, I, even I, am against you and will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations. Close quote. Now, God proclaimed his anger and disgust. The people heard the words of God that Ezekiel spoke and, and they had a choice to make. I wonder what choices you and I would make if we had been faced with that today, <laughs> we live in a different time. We live in a time that Jesus Christ has died on the cross, paid the cost of our sin and uh, rose from the dead to overcome sin. And the next thing you know, we have freedom to worship God and ask forgiveness of our sin. But what choice would we have made? We're going to study that today as we look at God as against his people. 
What does that mean? God is against his people. I thought God was for his people. Well, we're going to talk about that from Ezekiel chapter 5, beginning with verse 11. Take your Bible guide, turn out. Uh, turn to the page today as we read it and open up the Word of God. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can call us or you can write to us. Or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, click on the page. It'll take you to a place where you can make a donation. Thank you for your donations. And we will pray for everybody dealing with this uh, inflationary crisis and all of that later in the program because God is going to take care of us if we learn how to give to Him. Chapter five is Jerusalem will be destroyed. We're going to talk about that in the last part of the chapter. Chapter six, Ezekiel chapter six is the judgment against idolatry. And then chapter seven is the day of wrath of the Lord. Let me tell you, this is absolutely stunning. And let's pray. Father, today, as we look at this passage that leads us in an interesting way, Help us to hear what you're saying to us right now. Help us to know what you've said to us so that we can make it a part of our lives. And if there are people who do not know you, who are watching this program, I simply pray, Lord, that you would touch their heart and help them today, as you did over 45 years ago for me. Uh, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would come into their heart and touch them and help them to see the true meaning of what you have done. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen and amen. Now, as we look at this, let's study Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 11, because we studied the first part of the first 10 verses in previous years. This year's the first time we've studied this passage. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord. Now, surely, because you have defiled my sanctuary, with all your detestable things and with all your abominations. Therefore, I will diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. One third of you shall die of the pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. One third of you shall fall by the sword all around you. And I will scatter another third to all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thus says my anger be spent. Thus shall my anger be spent. And I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be avenged. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal when I have spent my fury upon them. Now, this is really fascinating. God proclaims the future of Jerusalem and Judah. Do we despise God's work today? Do we complain to the Lord rather than praise him? It's a good question, isn't it? Do we always come to the Lord asking, oh God, help me, oh God, oh God, oh God. Or do we praise the Lord? Even though we are in great need. It's temporary. It's temporary. Our need is temporary. There's coming a day when God will supply everything we need and we will be happy. Let me tell you something. Ezekiel chapter five, verse 14 says, moreover, I will make you a waste and repro reproach among the nations that are all around you in the sight of all who pass by. Which brings me to the second point. God let the nations see his punishment on his people. As followers of Christ, we must live our life and our lives knowing that people are watching us as a testimony of him. I want to tell you something. The biggest problem I have is when people say, well, uh, I'd love to serve God as soon as I see somebody else doing it. Because people tend to make decisions about God based on other people. And that's unfortunate. Now, God knows that, and he says, I need to give you a testimony. I'm going to give him to change your life. And if your life has been changed, truly changed, where you're, you know, you're trying to go against sin and all of that, it doesn't mean that you go crazy, but it means that you live differently. And if your life changes, you tell people, and people see a difference. And when they see a difference, they see God. Let me tell you something. Now, that's important. Now, he's talking to his people. And this is what he says in chapter 5, verse 15. So it shall be a reproach, a taunt, a lesson, 
and astonishment to the nations that are around you, all around you. When I execute judgments among you in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes, I, the Lord, have spoken. And when I send against them the terrible arrows of famine, which shall be for destruction, which I will send to destroy you, I will increase the famine upon you and cut off your supply of bread. So I will send against you famine and wild beast, and they will bereave you. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now this brings me to the third point. God's judgment can only be avoided through repentance. What does that word mean? Well, followers of Jesus Christ live each day in repentance. It does not mean that you invite Jesus Christ into your heart and he joins your life. That's not what it means. What repentance means is that you reset who you are. And you align your thinking with the thinking of God's word and the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some of you are not prepared to do that today, but some of you are. And if you are, pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life, take over my life. And I believe that you came and died on the cross 2000 years ago, paid the cost of sin and rose from the dead and overcame the result of sin. And I need you in my life. I believe you, Lord Jesus Christ. Help me today in the midst of all the pain and the trouble we're feeling. Help me today, Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now, you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. Today, as we continue our journey through the fascinating book of Ezekiel, I want to talk about angels. Now, from the very first chapter, Ezekiel encounters four living creatures who we learn in chapter 10 are a specific type of angel known as cherubim. And cherubim show up quite a bit in the Bible, and their images were even used in the Israelite tabernacle and later temples. But what's really interesting is that these images of real angels may have been the inspiration for the mythological creatures such as the Sphinx and Griffin. Now, the big question is if these mythological creatures are a corruption of the very real angels. Let's find out. There are many incredible and fanciful tales of heroes and gods, magical creatures and the like. The half-god, half-human hero Hercules is a prime example. Other popular fables include the exploits of the wizard Merlin, along with King Arthur and his famous Knights of the Round Table. While all agree that these stories are merely myth and legend, it is also generally agreed that many of these tales have some basis in reality, no matter how small. Indeed, when we follow the development of myth, it can be observed that over time, history can be made into myth and myth can become more mythical. It is not difficult to imagine how a true story could become inflated and corrupted as it is told and retold by many different cultures throughout the ages. The same seems to be true for certain mythological creatures, in particular those which are animal-human hybrids such as the Sphinx and Griffin, though it appears that the various portrayals of these creatures are closer to reality than one might expect. In any attempt to separate fact from fiction, we must consider the biblical record, which has repeatedly demonstrated itself as a reliable and truthful account of history. Interestingly, one does not have to look too far into the biblical text to discover a possible connection. That's because in just the third chapter of Genesis, we are introduced to those heavenly creatures called cherubim. Interestingly, the Bible describes these angelic beings as having both animal and human-like features, such as wings, human hands, and multiple faces, including that of a man, lion, and eagle. And their primary function seems to be that of guardian or protector. 
With this important role, it is obvious why images of cherubim were found everywhere in the Israelite tabernacle and temple. But images of these guardians are not exclusive to Israel. Cherubim-like figures are found in ancient Near East iconography on everything from monumental architecture in temples and palaces to reliefs and seals. Because their true image was eventually lost over time, the cherubim are variously depicted as creatures that are composites of human and animals. In Sumer, the figures are of winged humans. In Egypt, Syria, and Israel, the figures are of winged humans, or a composite of a lion and a human, known as a sphinx. In Assyria and Babylon, a winged bull and a human. And in Greece, a bird and a human, also called a griffin. But despite their various appearances, their role as protectors and guardians remained the same. For images of such creatures have been found flanking the thrones of kings or placed at the entrances to temples. A prime example is the golden throne of King Tutankhamun, which has arms made like winged lions, and his burial chamber is surrounded on four sides by pairs of winged human figures. Based on these findings, it seems likely that these mythological creatures are images based upon the very real angelic beings known as cherubim. While this idea that these mythological creatures are corruptions of angels is really fascinating, we shouldn't be dogmatic about it because we don't know for sure. What we do know for sure is that angels are very real beings created by God, but they're not to be worshipped. The Apostle John in Revelation 22 found himself very overwhelmed and fell at the feet of an angel to worship him. But the angel rebuked John and said, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. You know, angels are like us in that they're created beings of God, so we must not worship them, only worship God. Now, as a matter of fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.3 that one day we the saints will actually judge the angels. Now, these angels Paul's talking about are most likely fallen angels, but whatever the case, we need to make sure to worship only God. God commanded us as much in the first two Ten Commandments. And I think it's important to remember that John also in the book of Revelation uh, he he's overwhelmed because of the holiness of God. Absolutely, yeah. God's holiness is everywhere in heaven. He got caught up in the, in the moment. Yeah. He did, and he worshipped the angel, and the angel said, stop it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> said, don't worship me, worship Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Yes. And uh, which, that that's really fascinating. So that's really good, Ryan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Corey? All right. Well, today, you and I are going to be taking a look at incense because in Ezekiel chapter six, uh, you know, God is talking through Ezekiel about how he's bringing judgment onto Judah and how he has already on Israel because of their apostasy. And one element of this apostasy, of this false worship, this idolatry that had, you know, become really ingrained in their culture was the use of incense, but in a false way. So let's take a look at incense in the Bible in general and how it was supposed to be used. Take a look. Burning aromatic substances has always been a way for people to turn poor smelling air into a more pleasant atmosphere. Incense in particular was valued in the ancient world for its purification properties. It was seen to be a type of cleaner for the air, and there were several commonly used and prized spices for this. The Bible tells us that incense was burned at the funerals of Jerusalem's kings, signifying its importance in their culture. But likely the most well-remembered biblical use of incense was in the tabernacle and the Jerusalem temple. Incense was burned daily on the specially made altar of incense, and a liquid version was used to anoint and commission the temple furniture, articles, and priests. Interestingly, while the descriptions of the incense altar and the rituals are given, their significance is not explained, their religious reasons not given. The careful reader of the Bible, however, will notice at least two later references to the symbolic meaning of incense. The first in the book of Psalms says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The second reference is like it and comes from the New Testament book of Revelation, where in chapter 5, the prayers of God's people are said to be the smoke of incense rising to God. And in chapter 8, the prayers of God's people are offered with the incense. 
This meaning is especially interesting when paired with the instructions for the Day of Atonement. Once a year, the high priest was to go into the Holy of Holies, but not without the protection of the incense. The smoke created by burning the temple's incense acted as protection for the priest, and God was said to actually appear in this smoke above the mercy seat. Prayer as a protection and as a vessel of revealing God. This incense offered in the Holy of Holies was not offered on the altar. Instead, hot coals were carried in on an incense shovel, and then ground incense was placed on top to create the sweet-smelling smoke. Archaeologically, there have been many incense shovels discovered, and none can claim direct heritage from the temple, but many from contemporary shrines and later synagogues make it very likely that they looked very much the same. So, you know, we, we see how amazing the, the imagery and, and the, the deep symbolism of incense really was supposed to be and how it's used throughout the Bible. It just is so, such an offense then that the people had begun to use it so falsely. They had traded the truth of God for a lie. And we see that here in Ezekiel chapter six, just reading you the first three verses here. It says, the, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against the mountains of Israel, prophesy against them and say, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys. I am about to bring a sword against you and I will destroy destroy your high places. Your altars will be demolished and your incense altars will be smashed and I will slay your people in front of your idols. So it's just this idea of this overwhelming false worship was bringing, you know, the, the it, it was bringing what it was all along, which was death and judgment. It's really interesting as you begin to study this and see uh, all of the things religious wise, uh, I say religious, but what I'm saying is spiritually, mm -hmm. uh, because our lives are spiritual. And there's a lot of people who deny that. Uh, and they say, well, science, 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 but our lives are spiritual. And uh, science is spiritual, no matter which way we cut it. So it's very, very interesting. Janice? All right, Light in a Dark Place is what I titled my segment for today. There's so much, I've got bookmark, bookmarks everywhere here and big long notes, and I'm praying today that the Holy Spirit will help me to get across where my mind is thinking in today. So, Light in a Dark Place, my first question is, are we, as the church in the world today, are we that light in a dark place? Because in chapter five of Ezekiel, he dramatizes Jerusalem's fall, and we hear in, in verse, let's see here, verse Verse five, I believe. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of all the nations and the countries all around her. And then he goes on to say, she has rebelled against my judgments by doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statutes more than the countries that are all around her. For they have refused my judgments and they have not walked in my statutes. And you can continue to read on in that passage uh, to see, to, to further see what's going on. Now, back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Israel's covenantal obligations to the Lord gained the admiration of the nations around the world. And we see that in that chapter as Moses talks to the people about their the importance of their obedience to the Lord. If Israel had obeyed these laws, she would have been the light of the world. And let's go back and read Deuteronomy 4, starting at verse 7. For what great nation, this is, this is Moses declaring this before the people, for what great nation is there that God is so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all of this law which I set before you this day? Verse 9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Listen, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. And he goes on to talk about the importance of the obedience of following God. So today, this is pre-cross, pre-Jesus Christ. And a lot of people say, well, this is the Old Testament, Janice. It doesn't matter anymore, but it, it does. It certainly does. If we say that we are a Christian, which means that we have given our lives to follow God, understanding that Jesus gave his life 
So as our gift to him, we give our lives to him and follow him to be that light in a dark place. Philippians 2, I don't have time to get into it today, but read Philippians 2. This is such a great chapter about how we are to live as followers of Jesus, who is the light of the world. And especially take a look at verses 12 through 18 about being light bearers. Jesus said of himself, John 18, verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 9, verse five, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and we as his believers, who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us, become those light bearers. So I don't wanna cast a stone at Israel in this time and say, well, you know, they didn't do what they were supposed to do because we are very much the same. Are we? Are we that way as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we individual people serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we a light bearer? of the gospel, of the message of Jesus Christ? Are we the light bearers, not just with our mouths, but more importantly, with how we live and keep ourselves? Are we ambassadors? Are we the watchmen? Are we the light of the world? Are we the salt of the world? We need to be. And I wanted to challenge each and every one of us today who calls ourselves a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, to think on these things. Today, we want to pray for everybody because uh, the world is concerned about this. And I read some statistics the other day uh, that we, people are concerned about the inflation. And Father, I pray today that you would reveal to us and help us understand that your Bible is true when it says that you will supply our needs. Help us, Father, as we give to you. Help us to understand that we trust in you and supply our needs, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.